If we don't get angry about this, there are going to be a lot of people among us who are going to suffer and continue to be in a richest country in the world and denied the health care that they so desperately need and, be, and deny as well using the health care policy as a preventive mechanism uh, as the health insurance industry did quite properly with to the, the tobacco industry. You'll notice, those of you who smoked a few years ago, uh, that you would be charged a premium if you were a smoker. That's a way to deter smoking. That's a preventive function of creative health insurance. Me medical malpractice, the last thing I want to talk about, it's considered, you see the headlines? Um, Obama looks kindly to some medical malpractice reform. Now, one would think that that deals with 100,000 people who die every year because of medical and hospital malpractice in hospitals. But no, that is considered off the table. What they're talking about when they talk about medical malpractice reform is how difficult are they going to make it for the victims to get compensatory justice in the courts for bad doctor practices and incompetent hospital practices. That is a real Orwellian misuse of, of words. Next time you see a report in a newspaper about medical malpractice reform, ask yourself whether there is any data in that article about how many people are estimated to die every year and about what it costs the country every year and, uh, and how much do victims get. The available evidence is as follows, apart from 100,000 deaths a year. And that doesn't count hospital-induced infections, which the Center for Disease Control estimates between 200 and 300 deaths a day. Hospital-induced infections, increasingly antibiotic drug resistant. Out of hundreds of thousands of victims of medical malpractice, less than 50,000 get a dime or more. The amount of money that is paid for medical malpractice verdicts and settlements is less than what we spend on dog and cat food. It's about $7 billion a year. Remember, the health care bill is $2.5 trillion. The doctor income, gross income, is slightly less than half a trillion. See, it's a very small percentage. And yet, it's held up as the great obstacle to rationalization of the healthcare business because of defensive medicine. The best study done on defensive medicine was done by the Office of Technology Assessment 12 years ago, just before Congress and Gingrich shut it down. And they concluded the following. There is very inadequate data on defensive medicine, but from what they could assemble, defensive medicine that is intrusive and is only conducted on you, the patient, because of liability fears of the doctor is malpractice itself. In other words, exposing you to an uh, unnecessary x-ray that is not indicated in terms of your medical condition, but is given you because a doctor thinks that he or she may be sued, that is unprofessional and malpractice itself, subjecting you to a higher level of radiation. What is called undefensive medicine is very, is very often good medicine. It's careful medicine. Or it's medicine that's not needed but is given because it increases the fees of doctors. Some doctors are unscrupulous. Or, as I say, malpractice itself because it's intrusive, if it is intrusive. In short, let's start getting some studies here because I hear doctors talking about defensive medicine, and then when I say to a doctor, well, please tell me, what defensive medicine do you do? And not very articulate on that. It's always some other doctors, because they don't like to admit it. If we want a different dispute resolution system, let's talk about it. But let us not exclude the vast majority of people 
who knowingly or unknowingly are subjected to medical harm due to incompetence, indifference, or actual criminal behavior, and in some cases it is. There's a Rhode Island physician who's in jail now because he implanted devices in elderly patients who didn't need them just to get the, the money, and he was convicted. But is to provide those people with an adequate remedy, and in providing with a remedy, improve the disciplinary authority of the state commission, medical licensing commissions so that the 5 to 10 percent of the physicians who are incompetent or otherwise physically incapacitated from delivering competent medical care, that they be taken out of the profession. And the American Medical Association estimated years ago that that's roughly the figure, 5 to 10 percent, which is true in most professions, if not more, legal, accounting, and so forth. And right now, there's very little regulation taking the licenses away from recidivist physicians. 5% of all physicians account for about 50% of malpractice litigation, recurrently. So I'll leave you with this. How many people have ever heard or read of HR 676? All right. Now, years ago, I would have to say, Call your congressman and get a copy. It's online. Just go online, Congressman John Conyers. Go online, Congressional Research Service, whatever, and you can get it. That is a single payer or full Medica Medicare for all legislation. It's hard to look forward to another 10 or 15 years before there's another round of legislation debate in Congress to deal with this momentous issue. It's hard also to figure out how to mobilize people to get it done. But let me give you one estimate. If one million people broken down, 2,000 in each congressional district, organized a little civic club, the way people joined bird watchers groups and bowling leagues, and if they resolved that their life's civic achievement is going to be health insurance for everybody. And they went to work and they raised $200 each a year and opened two offices in each congressional district to two full-time people to be their regular link with their two representatives and two and representative and two senators. And if they had town meetings and publicized and educated many of the 600,000 other people in each congressional district. Within two years, you would have the kind of health insurance system that we could hold our heads with pride and face the rest of the world with. Two years. We should never overestimate the power of corporations any more than we should underestimate. But the more we underestimate our own power, the more we think these corporations are unchallengeable and cannot be reformed. That was the case in the auto industry, was the case with the tobacco industry. The moment people said, these companies have to be disciplined, they have to be taught how to behave, they have to be civilized in their interactions with their customers, Significant, very significant changes occurred. <clears throat> Tobacco industry was a perfect case study of one of the greatest health movements in the history of our country. When we started fighting for non-smoking sections in airlines and interstate buses and trains around 1968, we were told that we could never defeat the tobacco industry. At that time, 45% of American adults smoked regularly. Fast forward to this year. We're slightly under 20% of adults smoking regularly. There are non-smoking sections almost everywhere. Nobody dares smoke in classrooms. I used to walk into my Princeton lecture room and sometimes I could hardly see my fellow students. That's how, much, how, much, how many smokers were there. The tobacco industry is on the run. 
There are going to be rigorous advertisement controls against 